Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for coming on this late Sunday evening where one normally does other things than going to a lecture. Thank you very much. Because I think it's a little bit kind of a joke that a German comes to Ireland to speak to Irish people about the early Irish Christianity. Um, I excuse myself uh, for using wrong words maybe sometimes, so I'm, I, I need you to help me maybe to find the right words. When you go to the act of consecration of man, I don't know how you feel, but I think the longer I celebrate, the more questions I get. So when you hear something about we should be conscious of our humanity to feel the Divine Father, or to be aware of the Christ in our humanity, or we should grasp the Spirit, I think it's difficult. And on one hand, I love the Irish blessings. And I want to tell you two blessings now. The problem is when you got to know Irish blessings in Germany, and you're not quite sure, are they originally from Ireland? Or did the Germans make something out of it? So I, I hope this is really an original Irish blessing. Because I think they put it in a lot more easier to understand words, or words which are easier to understand. So this one blessing says, May God Father lead your steps. May God Son guide your arms. May God Holy Ghost conduct your understanding to do as much good as possible. I think that's just the easy way how living should be. Yeah, that the Father God leads your steps, the Son God leads what you're doing with your arms, with your hands, that the Holy Ghost conducts your understanding. And what for? Just to do as much good as possible, that's it. So if we would be in Germany, now we could start a course about two or three weeks, what is the good? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> But we're in Ireland, so I just say to do as much good as, as possible. Now comes something intellectual. I found that in a, in a book, and, and there was a symposium a little bit after this book came out, which you mentioned. Yeah. Um, it was in the 1990s. It was a symposium from Celtologics. And they summarize something at the end. So this is a little bit hard to, to read. I hope you understand me. And they say about the Celtic culture, especially in Ireland and Scotland, no European people has dominated the cultural development of the West in such a comprehensive form with the means of the spirit alone and without hegemonic claims as the Irish from the late 6th century to the early 9th century. The, the emergence of Europe as an idea as well as a historical reality in the course of the early Middle Ages was decisively influenced by the erudition and strength of faith of Irish monks and missionaries on the continent. The Christian tradition in its Anglo-Saxon Irish form thus stands on an equal footing with the Mediterranean Roman Greek heritage of Europe. In its heyday, the influence of Irish spirits, so also from Celtic spirits, mm -hmm. stretched from Iceland to Trento in southern Italy, from Kiev in the Ukraine to the legendary island of St. Brandon in the west. So this whole area was influenced from Irish monks and missionaries from their understanding how the spiritual world, world works together with the ele elemental world, with the natural world. But normally, when you grow up, grow up in Germany, you only learn, even when you go to a Waldorf school, um, you learn the main influence comes from Greek, comes from Rome, that's it. This is our culture on which we stand. Nobody is talking about the Irish in influence. And I think this is really miserable in this days. And 
When I was a little bit sorry or questioning myself if I could do this talk here, Ute says, no, no, you, you try, make it. Um, I guess most of those things which I mention a little bit later, you will know, but maybe two or three new coins are in this whole thing. So, another blessing, which, which I want to tell you at the beginning, I love it. May you always have a view of the sun falling through your window, and not for the dust which lies on them. <laughs> May you always have a view for the sun which comes to your window, and not for the dust which lies on them. It would be typical German to look on the dust, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and to argue about the dust, and who can it clean away, and so, so on. And uh, I love it. I love it. So, in the... Um, I, I want to start with a letter to the Galatians, which is in the Bible. So, when you don't know what to read in the next weeks, maybe you can take the Bible and read the letter from Paul to the Galatians. On the one hand, it's very important because there's one sentence out of the Bible which Rudolf Steiner mentioned so often when he says, it's not me, it's the Christ in me. This word is from the letter to the Galatians. But because um, I mention it, is mentioning it because there are three points which, which I want to emphasize. In this letter to the Galatians, um, I have to make an interruption. Galatians you can also translate as Celtics. Galatians is just another, it's the Roman form of, of Celtic. So the letter to the Galatians actually means the letter to the Celtic people. And in this case, a special group of the Celts which lives south of the Black Sea, yeah, where he wrote it. But they had the same culture as the Celts in Ireland, in England, in Germany, in Austria, and wherever. And uh, there are three things which he mentioned. The one thing is that he talks about the natural elements which we all have, or you could say our lower nature, where we have instincts and so on. So we are, th through our lower nature, connected with the nature outside, with the earth. And he says, this is one sphere which we have. But on the other hand, we also have a spiritual sphere where we can connect with the spiritual world. And within these two spheres is the sphere of the soul, which we can develop on earth or we do it not. But then, uh, Paul says, and in no other letter, he says it in so many words, um, we need rules, we need laws to deal with our um, lower nature, with the nature of the elements. And this is another interesting thing, talking about the elements of the nature which have an influence on the human being. Um, it's never mentioned as often as in this letter to the Galatians, three times. N nowhere else in the, in the whole Bible. So uh, he says, when we are only influenced by our um, nature part, there comes now I need your help, maybe, fornication. He says impurity, debauchery, idolatry. Is that right? Yeah. I, I, idolatry. Idolatry. Idolatry, thank you. Now an interesting thing, wrong magic comes from that. So when you talk about wrong magic, there has to be a good magic. And it's interesting, Rudolf Steiner says about the sacraments, they are white magic. White magic is something which you don't understand maybe fully at the moment, but you are able to understand it. You can talk about it. You can try to explain it. Black magic is something which happens and you have no idea what it is. And the guy who is doing it doesn't want you to know how it works. This is, he, he called it, black magic. So I overthink when I start my car, it's sort of black magic, because I don't really know what happens when I turn the key. It just runs, or not, but when it runs, a lot of things happens. 
And I have actually no idea. So, he says wrong magic. And Paul also says to the Galatians, you are bewitched. And from who are you bewitched? And it's interesting, this word bewitched just is mentioned there in the whole Bible, nowhere else. So it is possible that people can be bewitched. And I think in our times, in the last one and a half year, one can ask questions. Who wants to bewitch whom with which words and for sure not blessings, what they tell us. So um, what else comes from the natural elements? Hostility, quarrels, arguing, jealousies, rifts, squabbling, duality, party division, intrigues, binge drinking. <laughs> really? Binge drinking? Binge drinking. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I heard some younger people talk about it. Reveling and so on and so on. And to fight against all these things, we need laws. Maybe laws which a community gives them its, itself, or maybe rules which I give my, myself, or maybe rules uh, government gives. Them. This is not my issue to, tonight. But it's just necessary to have rules to fight um, the natural elements within every person. And he says... What comes from the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, there are no laws for that. You can't give laws for, for that. And I would say, or what I will mention a little bit later, this is what our politicians in Germany ask us to do. But the problem is they can't give a rule for what they want, how I should behave. This has to come from the heart. Well, it, it comes from the heart, or it doesn't come. Because what is a fruit of the Spirit from working with the Spirit is love, joy, freedom, magnanimity, right? magnanimity, kindness, fidelity, equanimity, and self-control. For all these things, you can't give rules or laws. You can't say, you have to love. No. When you're not doing it, you're not doing it. You can't say, be kind, grandma is coming. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. For, for sure. Um, and he said, this only comes when you, as an individual, start to work with the spiritual world. And I would say what a lot of politicians in Germany want us to do in, in COVID times is be kind, uh, have respect to the other people, be careful with the other people, uh, be friendly. You don't have to love them, but be friendly. You can't give a rule for being friendly to another person. Whether this comes out of yourself or it doesn't come. And if you don't work with the spiritual world, it does not come. Or you are friendly, but just that the other person gives you a little bit more from what you want. Yeah? It doesn't come out of the heart. So about this whole thing, the human soul, the human eye, Rudolf Steiner would, would say, develops itself with working with the spiritual world and fighting against the natural elements which are in, in yourself. So, so this is the one point. The other point is that the word freedom in the letter to the Galatian is never mentioned so often as in this letter, in the whole Bible. Three times. Or four times. Sorry, four times. Even in the um, Gospel of St. John, it's only mentioned twice. You do not find the word freedom very often. But I would say what our main aim is, our main goal is, how can I be a free person? How I can, can I be a free in, individual? So he's talking a lot about that. And he's talking a lot about Abraham. But, uh, I mean, Abraham is mentioned a lot in the whole Bible. But Paul writes to the Galatians, the main thing on Abraham for him is Abraham heard God calling him. 
leave your land. Go to another land and find, find God there. This is what you have to, to do. And this is the reason why the Irish monks did this peregrination. I guess you all heard of that. This, this wandering, especially to the, to the um, continent of, of Europe, and bring the Irish culture to the um, continental European people. They all uh, looked back to Abraham, what Paul mentioned in this letter to the Galatians. So, um, now I want to tell you a little bit about geology. So this was very new for me. I have a teacher in my smaller congregation in Germany, and he told me, so this is no anthroposophy and so on, just what the scientists say, uh, so it has been. About 430 million years ago, America and Europe were one continent. I would say we would, we would have called it the old uh, Atlantis. But then he said there was a continent so the dinosaurs could walk from New York to Moscow without getting wet feet. <laughs> there was no, no problem. A little bit later, the, the um, um, uh, one continent uh, de was de divided and drifted away from each other. And in Ireland you have this way, I, when I'm right informed, it's from Dublin to Galway. It's an old pil pilgrim way. It has a name. I for, forgot it. <clears throat> yeah, and this this way, and you have the the shelling going from the north to the south, and in the middle of this way and the shannon, there's cloning noise. Yeah, yeah. yeah? yeah. and uh, so for example, all the stones, all the ground north from Clonmac Noise is the same stone as in North America. So that part of Ireland originally belongs to America. The south of Ireland belongs to Europe. And even if Boris Johnson wants to go out of the European Union, even Scotland, even England, uh, even Cornwall, is European if he wants to go out or not. It will be European. So that was very interesting for, for me, that this division from Ireland uh, in north and south has a very, very long way back where you can, can, can look at it. And he said it's when you when you um, untersuchen, search, research. Re, re, research all these stones, you find the same stones in Northern Ireland as in New York City. Yeah, it's the same granite stone which you find there. And I thought this is really, really interesting. Now, I want to tell you a legend. I guess you know it. Um, there are actually no snakes in Ireland. And the one legend is that St. Patrick uh, told them to go away. I guess there's a lot of Catholic influence in this uh, legend. So far, I, I like another legend a lot more. So you know this thing when Adam and Eve have been in the paradise and the thing with the apple and so on, and then God said, okay, you have to go out. Yeah, You're not allowed to stay here in the paradise anymore. But a little bit later, he said, no, I can't throw them out of paradise and send them to earth and they have no possibility to remember how the paradise was. And so we took part of a paradise and made an island of it and put it into the sea. And you can guess which island that is. Um, so this is from one legend, the origin of Ireland, how it, how it be, became. As you know, lots of people, lots of people came in different ways. There have been four waves, all in all, to Ireland. Um, there were people coming from the Black Sea. There were people coming from Egypt, um, and they all brought their different cultures with them. But all these cultures were um, megalithic, megalithic culture. And the Celtic wave started round about 500 before Christ, uh, the birth of Christ. 
500 before Christ, the Celts, Celtic, Celts, 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 Celts thank you, Celts came to, to Ireland, and this wave stopped around about 150, 100 B before Christ. And I guess some of you know it better than me, um, till the middle of the last century on the Aran Islands, where some people who spoke a language nobody, nearly nobody understood it. It wasn't Irish, it wasn't Gaelic, it was a different language which they talked, uh, uh, talked with, with each other. And then also this language died. So those people on the Aran Island, they came with a third wave, originally from the far south, from, from the Egypt area. So this whole island is, is Celtic. If some people say yes or no, it's just what the sci scientists say, it is Celtic. Like the whole of Europe. The whole of Europe was influenced by the Celtics. And the special thing in this megalithic culture to which the Celts belong was that they never had quarrels about believing. It was always clear to, to them, in the sun lives the highest God. There was no doubt about that. There was no doubt about there is a life after death. There was no arguing about reincarnation. It was absolutely clear for, for them. And the wandering of souls, that was also clear for, for them. The Irish developed out of this kind of believing uh, dealing with time, which so far I know you don't find in Europe in any other country. So it was interesting for, for me when you read some stories about Ireland, some legends about Ireland, it is possible that an historic person meets a person which is far, which, which has its own origin far away in the, in the past. So, and I think the best example is St. Bridget. St. Bridget, as you know, was before the Christianity one of the highest gods from Ireland. She um, also created the whole world with her coat and everything. This Bridget um, is the same Bridget which was the foster mother of Christ. And this Bridget was the same Bridget which lived in the 5th century. And you have some legends where all these three Bridgets uh, just live with each other, give their um, forces, uh, strengths to, to another Bridget. So and it's no problem to read stories where time does not matter. There is a person doing something. This person has its origin far in the past. It works now and it will um, have its influence later on. And I think, so far I know, Bridget is the saint in Ireland. Is that right? One of the most saints? One, one of the most saints. One of the major. Yeah, major, 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 yeah. major saints, yeah. So I know no other country where not even ten years ago there was a new pilgrim way open from Kildare to the birth um, town where, where Bridget was, was, was born. I know no other country in Europe where they found new pilgrim ways which have its origin in the early Middle Ages. That's just Ireland. So again, one of these elements of, uh, elements of, of dealing with time which has its influences through persons till today. Another thing, what I think is very, um, very important, is that royal dignity never was a thing which was given from the father to the son um, in Ireland. Because uh, when a new king has to be chosen at the end of this choosing process, he has to go to the stone of destiny. Maybe you've been to Tara and know the stone of destiny. And on the stone, he had to put his foot on, on the stone. And when the stone cried out, that was the sign, 
the, uh, the a choice was right. It's up to your imagination how a stone cries, but this is the, the legend. So it was not a thing that a father said, okay, my son, you are the, the next king. It was a democratic element, sort of, not as we call it dem dem democratic to today, but a little bit. I think it's also that they uh, recognized that it was a quality of the person. Yeah, yeah. This is what they wanted to, to find out through, through different steps. You're right. So, and in Ireland, it was for many, many centuries, actually till the Vikings came, so in the late 18th, uh, 8th century, it was more or less a quiet island. The culture could develop. The Romans never came to Ireland. They came to the whole of other Europe, but not to Ireland. And with the Vikings, another culture started. And then in the 12th century, with Strongbow and so on, this British occupation of Ireland started till to today, in, in, in part. But that's a different story. Um, so the Christianity came to Ireland, as you know, I, I guess, not through conquests, not through revolutions. It just came through people who believed. And actually through monks who believed. And then there were people who said, oh, this monk, this, he seems to me that he's really holy, or she is really holy. Now, we call him saint. When you look at the process which is necessary from the Roman Catholic Church, that somebody is, is spoken as a saint, it takes actually centuries. All the saints from Ireland are made as saints from the people who say, we see this person dealing with his believing and how he is acting in the world like he does. This is what we call him saint. So the Catholic Church never called St. Bridget, St. Colum Killer, uh, St. Kevin, or whoever as a, as a saint. Never ever. Um, so this, I think, is really interesting. Uh, until 431, no one really knows how Christianity lived in Ireland. Some people say, um, because you can find that Ireland for centuries be before uh, Christ was born and died and uh, raised, uh, arose, they had trade with Egypt, Ireland had trade with Greek, Ireland had trade with Italy and, and Europe. So I think it might be possible that on that way the informations from the Christianity came to Ireland. I think it's no problem to, to think that way. To me, it's more obvious that what Rudolf Steiner says, that the Irish Druids had the f um, ability of being clairvoyant, and that they saw what happened in Jerusalem in the year 33. And from that point, it's not a long way to tell all the other people now the sun, uh, the, the God which lived in the sun, he came to earth. The sun came to the earth. So, but anyway, how you ever will be believe it, these are the both ways, I would say. Now I want to tell you something uh, in between, which comes from the founding of the Christian community. Because, as you know, we are going to our 100th anniversary in the next year and it is a big question how and with which ideas do we go in the next century because uh, the Christian community not only in Ireland is fighting and not fighting with the outer world more fighting with ourselves how and with which ideas and with which strength can we carry on and this is why I mentioned all these ideas from the letter to the Galatians, because I think these are the main impulses. We have to 
enliven in ourselves to go into the new century. As was mentioned, freedom, joy, kindness, love, these are all these things we need among each other. So, Rudolf Steiner had said three things which I think were very, is, are very necessary still for us. And that was in June 1921. He said, first of all, when you are founding a new church, there has to be a freedom of believing and a freedom of teaching. We are absolutely free what we believe in. No priest, no whoever can tell any one of you what he or she has to be believe. And oh yes, this is one thing we can, uh, we, we, we have to find totally new uh, because we think, yeah, that's normal. I can believe, I can't believe it is like it is. I mean, look at the big churches. They all tell their people what they have to be, be believe. And the people let them tell themselves what they are able to be believe, what they are allowed to believe. Sorry. So, for example, if we would go to a Catholic or to a Protestant church and want to talk about reincarnation, they would just throw us out. When we are talking about reincarnation, one can believe in it, the other not. Everything is okay. And maybe, I said that in, in the morning, maybe imagine Ute and I are giving two sermons on one evening. Maybe Ute is talking about the reincarnation and how great it is. And five minutes later, I go on the chancel and say, no, reincarnation, we don't have that. I don't believe in it. This is our freedom. We could do that. So this is the one thing. The other thing is that he said, you have to build free congregations, free um, com communities. So a question could be, what is the spirit of the congregation in Tuam Grain? Who are we? And what is different here from Kyle? What is different here from Hamburg, where, where I'm from? To find to find out what is our special spirit here, because that makes us free. If we know which consciousness we have, we start to, be, to become free. And the third thing is, um, Ute is the best example, the priesthood of women. That was absolutely clear from the beginning, men and women are absolutely equal in uh, uh, working as a, as a priest. At working at, at the altar, thank you. And from that point of view, I think it's interesting because Bridget also is absolutely on the same level as Colum Killer, as Kevin, as Kieran, yeah? And uh, closest of, of nuns who started straight from the be beginning in Ireland, not in Europe. So I think when we look back in those Irish. Um, Irish Christianity, we find points which we can or just have to grasp and re-enliven them and maybe they can lead us a little bit in the future. Another point is that Irish Christianity, as I said, we don't know how it developed here in Ireland till 431. In 431, the Pope in Rome sent Palladius to Ireland. Before, he went two times to Egypt to learn from the Coptic Christ Christianity, how, how that works. And with their experiences, they sent him to Ireland, but nobody was interested in what he said. It was maybe too obvious he came in the name of the Pope. So nobody was really interested in how he wanted to tell the people how they have to behave. Remember this thing of freedom in believing, freedom in teaching, freedom in con congregations. So after one and a half year, he went back to um, Rome. But more or less at the same time, in Rome appeared a man called Pelagius. Pelagius. It's obvious he came from Ireland. 
he was an Irish monk who appeared out of the blue in, in Rome and he said, uh, okay, when, somebody, when, when a baby comes to earth, when a human being comes to earth, it's actually good in its soul ground. It is good. Okay, when it's growing up, everybody has the possibility to behave in a bad way. But on the ground, you are good. This is what he taught. So from that point, you can imagine what was taught in Ireland. That every human being is good. Now, there were some from the Arch Fathers, from the Holy Church, which, which uh, taught a different uh, thing. Because they said, when the human being comes to earth, it's bad. It's absolutely bad. It's evil. Every human being, from, its, from the beginning of its life, is the product of the sin between a man and a woman. So making a baby is a sin. And then it's absolutely logic that the product of that, what a man and a woman did, is also evil, pure evil. And the only way to bring this person out of its evil status is to baptize it. With a baptism, you, cert, you, um, you, you take a little bit of the soul and bring it into heaven. Yeah? You just uh, retten, oh, sorry, save. save, yeah, you just save, save a little bit of the soul for, for the life after death. And because every human being is evil in the ground of its soul, every human being needs the church which tells every individual what he and she has to do. Now try to imagine who was stronger when you look in the world. With which teaching do you get more people? When you say everybody is free, but you have to work in the spiritual way, on, on your own, and that's hard. Or if you say you are evil, you have to be frightened, you have to be really frightened. But I can tell you when you behave in this and that way, you will be good, nothing will happen. I guess we can hear that again and again and again in the last month. Just making people frightened is the best way to get power over them. Yeah? And as we see, obviously, there are in enough people uh, who are frightened then and don't know how to behave and what they can do and not do and, and so on. So they managed it that although um, Pelagius wrote lots of letters, nearly wrote books, we have nothing from him anymore except one letter. It's only one letter left which he wrote to a 14-year-old girl who wanted to become a nun. It was a very long letter where he described to her what she has to decide, that she has to take her time, and what she has to do and think about, and with whom she should talk, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's just one letter. They managed to um, erase the whole teachings of Pelagius. Um, it's nothing left anymore. And the holy Saint Augustine and the holy Hieronymus, so these holy archfathers, they said about Pelagius, um, what is the Schildkröte again? Tur turtle. 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 Oh, sorry. This Pelagius, he walks like a fat Scottish turtle, turtle through Rome and says wrong teachings. So this holy person talked about that guy in that way. So I guess it's no wonder that we don't find anything about him anymore. They tried the same with uh, Johann Scottus Eriogena in the 9th century, but it was not that good, so we have some books from him still. Yeah? So all they always tried, starting in the early 5th century, 
to erase every teaching which was coming from Ireland. Everything. So this is why we actually don't know it, what have these Irish teachings been. And, but as I said, freedom, working on yourself with the spiritual world, um, it's in, enough. And try to live in free congregations, men and women equal. So, um, Augustine won, and uh, it's very interesting, um, this, this first time in Ireland, when the Christianity, Christianity developed, um, as I said, there was no influence from, from the Romans, they only came to England, um, and Rome just had an influence in 664. There was a synod in Whitby. Maybe you heard about that. And in Whitby, they decided, okay, the Irish are not allowed to do their sacraments like they did be before. But I think this is interesting because Rome started his, its, its influence but the arguing also started with this Roman influence. Before that, it wasn't necessary to argue about how should we do a sacrament. Because you can read it in the, in the <coughs> legends of the, of the saints, they saw what happened when somebody celebrated a sacrament. And when another person did it in a totally different way, this other person saw how it worked. So why do I have you argue when I see that it, it's, it's, it's working? Up to the fifth, uh, fourth century, we have round about the Mediterranean Sea 30 sacraments. And then Rome started, to, uh, started that they want to become the, the capital, and then they need unity. And when you need unity, you need to explain what's wrong and what's right. And when I am right, I mean, you have to be wrong. But sorry, because yeah, otherwise I can't tell you how you have to, to behave. So, um, and from that moment on, more or less, the Irish saints start to leave Ireland. And in the whole of Europe, which um, was left alone from the Romans, was a social and lawful chaos. It was, whole of Europe was just chaos because the um, infrastructure which the Romans gave me before just wasn't there anymore. So now all the different warlords came and said, okay, I'm stronger than, than you, I fight you, then I'm better, and so on. And now the Irish monks came to the to um, Europe, first to, to uh, Britain, the <coughs> Irish monks taught the British kings and their children. Maybe somebody should tell that Boris Johnson. And then a little bit later they went to, to, um, to, to Europe and it was the same thing there, that all the kings sent their children to the Irish they brought a teaching there. They were able, the Irish monks, they were able to speak Latin, to speak Greek, to speak Hebrew, and their own language for, for sure. And they always learned at first the language of those areas where they were. The Roman monks were maybe sometimes not even able to speak Latin. They had no um, knowing in comparison to the Irish monks. This is all what the Irish brought. And there are still lots of uh, scientists who find out in different um, churches in Europe, where they have old scriptures, if this is a scripture from an Irish, or somebody who was in this Irish school, or if it was from a Latin one, because on the way they wrote, they uh, painted the, the letters, each single letter. You can know if it came from Ireland or not. So they just 
bring it on the surface, make it obvious how much influence all this um, Irish uh, culture brought to you. Um, now I think I don't have to tell you a lot about the Irish saints, but one thing I would, uh, will tell you, just in Bavaria, so the south of Germany, Bavaria has more or less the same size as Ireland. Um, some some Kolokila came there, and he opened lots of monasteries and lots of schools, and we know today that only for Bavaria, uh, or only to Bavaria, there were sent over 660 monks, which were taught in Irish Christian, Irish understanding of Christianity, only to a Bavarian. <coughs> so this is really, really in interesting. Um, the influence, uh, as I said, brought with itself um, a new understanding of freedom, an understanding of that you are free to believe, and uh, they the Irish came to a, to a place, sorry, I'm just searching for the wrong way here, where it was, no, it was no structure in Europe, it was no spiritual orientation. And somebody said in the book, they brought the impulse of spiritual freedom. That was not known before. And when you look at Europe now, nobody knows what spiritual freedom is today. So I think this is something that you have forgotten. What can I understand when I talk about spiritual freedom? What we know in Europe is Benedict von Nursia. I guess you heard of him. Um, he had this talk, um, saying, ora et labora, et labora, et labora, et labora. As a, a pray and work. This is nothing against that what the Irish brought to Europe. Because they brought pray daily, work daily, study daily, and fasten daily. A fast, fasten. Fast, fast. So, yeah. So it was normal for the Irish, for example, when I'm right um, on, on Monday, on Wednesday, and on Friday, you're not allowed to eat before the early evening, each week. And then there were special times like Advent, like Passion Tide, and so on, where you were not allowed to, to, to eat. But each week, just starting um, at the early evening, that was normal for the monks. But you were free to decide if you want to become a monk or not. It's not like we know it from the Catholic Church. The family sent you, okay, you are a monk now because we don't know how to, to feed you. It was a free decision to become an Irish monk. Then, for example, in Bangor, in Northern Ireland, um, that was the capital of the early music, uh, the sacral music. You can find all that which uh, was collected there now in Bobbio, in, in Italy. That was the center. And... Uh, Twenty-four hours a day. Yeah. And yeah. 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 And actually, nobody knows that. Yes. You always think our oh, Greek Gregorian music. That's it from the far east or from wherever. Then it started here. Nobody cares about that. And I think it's such a pity. Yeah. Um. So, and. The last thing which I wanted to say is that the Roman Catholic Church practiced the confession, the sacrament of the con confession for sure, but confession in their understanding was public. It was mostly public. So when you, I mean, imagine when uh, maybe you did something not really so good and you have to go to the marketplace and the priest asked you, what did you do? And the whole village is standing there. It has been the Irish monks which brought to Europe the ear confession, so-called ear confession. And the Catholic Church just took it for itself later on. So all these influences which the Irish brought 
to um, Europe, I just name or tell you the countries where it came to. It was France for sure. It was Belgium, Luxembourg, the whole of Germany, Austria, Switzerland, the Czech Republic, Italy, and whole Scandinavia. So more or less the whole of Europe or Western Europe. Um, for example, Thomas von uh, Thomas Aquinas, you, you heard of them. His main teacher was Peter from Hibernia, Peter from Ireland, the main teacher from, from Thomas. And this whole influence started to end in the late 8th century. And that was Bonifatius, Boni, Boniface. And he got the permission from the Pope to stop all this Irish influence. And he had one element uh, how to control if the priests are really on, in his line now or if they are still trying to behave Irish. And that was, he brought, oh, how do you call that in English, so, celibacy. 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 That's it. Mm -hmm. So when a, when a priest lives like this, he is Roman. If he doesn't li live like, like this, actually he has to be Irish. Because the Irish monks, they were married for, for, for sure. It never was a question that you are allowed to marry. If you are marrying or not, this is an individual question. Not a question if somebody gives a rule. So that was his main element. Um, so that, that was made in 1139 to a dogma, but the 300 years before, with that Boniface uh, cleared Europe from the Irish influence. And he did his job so well that I would say mostly no nearly nobody in Europe, and I don't know, maybe nobody in Ireland, knows about this strong influence from the Irish Christianity to the Christianity which lives now in Europe. As I read before, the whole idea of Europe uh, is not only made by Greek and by the Romans on the same footing as they said, it's, it came from the Irish. And I think it's so necessary that we understand that. Sorry that I'm telling that to you who live here, but <laughs> I'm so be begeistered. I'm so... Uh... Thank you, yeah, I am. Maybe you uh, recognize it. So, then I'm coming to the end. Just uh, three... Um, sentences which I learned from, from uh, Irish writers. That would be another lecture to talk about Irish writers. It's so brilliant. So one, James Joyce. Uh, he said, and I think it's very interesting for our days now, he says, the life of an uprooted person seems to me much less contemptuous than the life of a person who re resigns himself to the tyranny of the average. I think this is brilliant. And George Bernard Shaw says, this is, this is with a little bit of humor, if a commission had been set up to create the world, it would not be finished today. <laughs> I thought this is good. And one last blessing, I hope this is originally Irish, at the end. The cemeteries are full of people with, without whom the world could not live. The cemeteries are full of people without whom the world could not live. For, for them, that a soul comes from this world to another world. You know all these legends with all these elves and so on and so on. This is more or less n normal. And for example, as you know, I, I hope, there never existed the understanding of a hell in Ireland, in early Christian. They did not know what hell is. 
was the Catholic Church was, which brought an understanding of hell to Ireland. So in no of these old fairy tales from Ireland you find something like hell. You find elves and, and so on and so on, which behave in a very bad way. Okay, but that's not hell. That's a totally different thing. So it is the spiritual world, it is nature around us, and it's the different world where the other beings live. But we have to deal with them somehow. And there are rules that they have their world, we have our world, and don't disturb each other. This is what we have to, to learn. But not when you act like this, you come to hell because you are evil. No. There was no reason for, for that. And I would think it would be great if we learn again, maybe especially in the Christian community, that every single individual is in its, in the, on the ground of its soul, it's good. Maybe this is what we have to bring into the world in the next 100 years. Because I guess it gets lost. Maybe it's different in Ireland, but in Germany it's horrible. When you go, or when you, when you uh, don't live uh, like the rules tell you that you have to, to, to live, the uh, call at the police is quicker than, than you can look. And it's really, really in, in interesting. How people think they have to control that you are living to all the rules the brave government gave to you, and so on. So maybe this thinking of the human being is good, and you are part of the spiritual world, but you have to work for it, to understand it. That is what you have to, to do. Maybe this is our goal, our challenge for the next 100 years. Thank you very much. I, I, I hope, no, thank you, please. I, I hope there were some, some new thoughts. Mm -hmm.